Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to present indeed uh, what are mainly some findings and uh, insights of my ongoing doctoral um, research at Ghent University. It's a research project by Eva de Klerk on these North Indian uh, Digambara monastic leaders. It's uh, sponsored by our Flemish Research Institute. Um, the Batarkas, I don't know how much of a general introduction is necessary if you want to imagine that for the bulk of the second millennium, there was only very few of these ideal Digambara monastics uh, around, the, the nude guys. And in, in that stead, for many centuries, you had these ascetics called Batarakas, which were um, not only clothed versus naked, they also were sedentary. And um, while the monastic rules were a bit more loose, you could say, they also managed temple property, so those are mainly the differences. The main thrust of the presentation what I propose is, in a way, actually, in a way, reapproaching both, um, reapproaching them in the sense that the general um, scholarly portrayal of Batarakas would be a very clear distinction between, on the one hand, you have Munis, and it's explicitly stated here by characters, but it's implicit present in virtually, I think, all current discussions of Batarakas. The Munis, on the one hand, as charismatic leaders or charismatic ascetics, and Batarakas, on the other hand, as routine leaders. So the, the materials, primary sources I'm presenting here, I think in a way they show that there is more continuity and more parallels than what we usually would expect. Um, in these contemporary scholarly accounts of the Batarakas, I, I analyze these two tropes, these two items which always show up. Uh, the first one is the Batarakas as a kind of clerics, which focuses on their administrative roles, you could say, in a way. And, um, which would sum up to be this. Um, manuscript conservation, Batarakas are lauded, really, for their efforts in the copying of manuscripts. And after yesterday's beautiful paper by Sario Dushiji, I should add scrolls, so I should add manuscript and scroll conservation. Quite a, a few of them wrote a lot themselves. And the second thing, apart from that, for which they are really well remembered in the Jain community as well, is for the many consecrations they did go into any Digamra temple which is uh, older than say 50, 100, 200 years and you will find a lot of murtis which have been uh, consecrated by Batarakas, the inscriptions say so. And then the, the other three, you could sum them up as the Batarakas, they were very much, they had a strong worldly involvement, they acted as caste gurus, they led pilgrimages and they negotiated with the rulers. Um, this is a, a positive evaluation of those Batarakas. The other trope is a negative evaluation and it always discusses the way Batarakas are lax or corrupt or uh, versus their monastic discipline and they are ritualistic, they are only focused on the ritual vis-a-vis uh, -vis versus a say more adhyatmic approach to Jainism. So these two things seem to pop up in the current state of the art so the materials I will be presenting will be um, showing something differently. The last point here just one um, Quotation here, uh, Sangavi speaks of the loose conduct of the Batarakas and the Digambara sect being saved from the clutches of the Batarakas by the Terapan. So, I mean, this is very explicit, of course. Um, so, what you have here is a limited appreciation, and uh, the Batarakas would be called, I think the Hindi word is Samrakshak, so in a kind of, in a way, protectors of the Digambara tradition in this inauspicious time of. Um, uh, Muslim rule when naked Munis were hardly able to roam, roam on the streets in fear of persecution. Um, so that's the positive thing, but in the end, the bottom line would be that what you find in the contemporary accounts or what you do not find is any description of the Batarakas as charismatic ascetics, or there is no sign of formerly any devotion towards the Batarakas, either as a type of ascetic still or as gurus. So that's my analysis of the current um, accounts. I, have, I contrast these with some primary sources I've been looking into and gathering. Most of them are textual. There's this archaeological thing. And a few places I will be drawing some parallels with cults of contemporary ascetics, which show that there is quite a lot of uh, continuity in the way Batarakas were worshipped and the way today's naked ideal Munis are worshipped still. Um, to start with, there's these funerary monuments which can be found throughout the region. We're studying only Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, and the Delhi area. Um, wherever I've been so far, where there used to be Bataraka seats, you find these kinds of uh, funerary monuments, often a few of them at the same place. These are the cremation sites. 
Inside you have these padukas, so that's a representation of, of the Batarakas feed. You have long inscriptions which give a lot of historical information or are very interesting in their own right for that sense. Um, you see a stylistic evolution. This is the second century, this is 18th century. Um, and for example, here in South Rajasthan, Sagwara, you have these typical or in fact rather atypical square chatris with multiple floors and here instead of padukas you can also have these pillar-like structures, nishirikas, which are also kind of a commemorative monuments and these also have representations of Batarakas and inscriptions of the date the Bataraka died and his uh, guru Parampara. Um, this place just shows you where these to be found whenever there is a hill around there is a strong preference for, for the hills, for the cremation sites and for the monuments. This is Sagwara. Uh, and in the 20th century, as we've seen in another paper, in general, in the, probably only the second half of the 20th century, anthropomorphic images became popular. So apart from Padukas, you also start to have these. This, these are actually the two last Batarakas of uh, North India. This is a Chandra Burshan of Sonagiri, uh, died in 1974. And the very last one, Yasha Kirti of uh, Pratabgarh and Kesharia in 1978. This is more like of a if I can call it that way, decorative statue in the sense that it's protected by a glass window so people cannot actually offer something. This is really a chatri as we see seen them with the padukas but together with an anthropomorphic image here. Uh, this map, I'll be doing more mapping out, this just gives you an idea of the places I've visited so far and it's not really indicative of where they are to be found or where they are not to be found, these chatris. Uh, I haven't started serving Madhya Pradesh but I already know of several places where you have these sites with chatris, with padukas, with nishirikas. And that gives you just an indication of how many padukas or chatris found at each place. So there's these few important Digambara places in Gujarat, but there's a lot I've seen in, in Rajasthan mostly. Strangely in Delhi, um, while knowing Delhi a little bit, you can just imagine that these places would be bulldozered away with the city expanding. So, or they might be hiding somewhere, but I don't know. Mm. Now first parallel here, today also, uh, Chatris are built for acharyas like this one, sometimes rather elaborate, and inside this chatri here, uh, Shiv Shagar uh, and the Parampara of Shanti Shagar Dakshin, again his padukas and this anthropomorphic um, image. Uh, Munis would have these more generic, simple type of chatris, and here you have three chabutras, they're called, with the padukas of nuns. Nuns are usually um, commemorated by these very simple platforms. Padukas have disappeared already from here, but they're here, and there's exceptions. This is Banswara, where a very charismatic nun apparently lived for a long time, and she got this um, Guru Mandir, so this more elaborate structure, and these would all be typical Muni structures. So this is the cremation site, and at the very place um, you get these chatris, and at this place also a cremation had apparently, when I visited, taken place just recently. Uh, some maybe the, the work for the foundations is ongoing, and already there's a bit of worship going on. You can see a little oil lamp here. So, I mean, these places and their worship. Interestingly here, these are two Acharya Chatris, uh, Rajasthan, and this is Hastinapur, where people actually uh, told me that they uh, did bury relics here in these Chatris before they were being built, and you could suspect for the same to have happened with the Bataraka Chatris also, but it's just difficult to, to tell. There is no way of proving it. It's not written in the inscription, but today in these places, relics are being buried. This is the same Chatri as we saw before of a Bataraka, and down here you have Acharya Yoga Sagar who died in this place and the poster announces the building of his uh, Samadhi stall, of his uh, Chatri and already some worship has taken place and there also people told me that yes when we built this thing there will be relics of him which we kept aside now being buried at that place. Um, apart from the sites of the cremation in, gen in temples in general you can find a lot of padukas of the most famous monks like here um, Shanti Sagar Chani. Uh, Shanti Sagar Dakshin, so many padukas to be found, and this is a bit different in the sense that this is a living ascetic who is being worshipped through his padukas here. So this um, Muni inspired the building of this temple, so <coughs> people going in that temple have a strong connection to him, and they they actually already worshipping, you can see here, uh, rice being offered Agra Puja, so in front of the padukas, not on top of it. So the same way you had the Padukas and the Chatris of the Batarakas, you have the same practices still today with the Munis. And then there's a textual dimension which relates to the same thing. Um, we're talking about Puja, so it's Ashtadravya Puja, the typical Digambara style of offering these eight substances in a Tali, which would be done for any Jina, any Siddha Chakra Puja, whatever. The same type of Puja, same type of ritual texts I found in, in three places. Uh, this is from the Amer Shastra Bandar, Bhattarak Jagat Kirti Ki Puja. 
Um, I offer endlessly at the, the lotus feet of Surendra Kirti, and indeed Batarak Surendra Kirti was the guru of Jagat Kirti. Um, let me show this a bit later on. This is a very typical um, Digambara ritual introductory verse in Sanskrit, which uses these uh, bij mantras. I'll show the full thing later on. But what you get after that is the, the eight substances being offered. So that goes water, fragrance, rice, flowers, sweets, lights, um, uh, incense, and uh, fruits. And these are offered. And the texts refer explicitly to the padukas, padukas of the Batarakas. And um, this is another example here, Ankleshwar. This is one of the, the Surat Bataraka Gadis. Every day I worship the feet. Every day I worship these lotus feet. And the third place where I found them, and actually this is the only three places where I really looked for them. By now I expect to find these kinds of puja texts in, in every place. I mean, they are related to the chatris. Um, here it speaks of a Pushpanjali being thrown at the feet of the guru. And at the end here, usually they, they identify which Bhattaraka the puja was written for. In this case, it's a, it's a Gyan Bhushan of the Eder seat. Um, now, this is all puja and worship of um, deceased ascetics. There's also, in this Diksha Vidi here, this uh, Bhattaraka ordination ceremony prescription ritual. There's the same Om Harim kind of thing which worships, and here it says, Paramparagattam Suri Mantram Dadiyat. So the, immediately after, this is not the start of the manuscript, but immediately after the Suri Mantra has been given to the Bhattaraka, effectively um, establishing him as the new Bhattaraka on the pod. At that point, you get the same kind of worship of a living Bhattaraka. So again, both deceased and living ascetics being worshipped in the same way. And um, well, should I? That's surely is interesting to just show you very slowly, uh, very shortly. It says here Parameshtin. So Bhattarakas are called here Parameshtin, which would be a little bit, I mean, untraditional. Say usually you would have uh, the five uh, great men and Bhattarakas as clothed ascetics would not not really be included there. I mean, it's very telling actually. And later on, you also have Tilakam at the Padayus being applied to his feet, and he gets to recite uh, the Gurva Wali of his tradition. I mean, the, the manuscript in itself is very interesting for different reasons, too. Um, now, I was talking about the sites in Dili being bulldozed away. Why wouldn't it surprise me to have happened there? Because the other Chhatris elsewhere also, they're not visited very often. And this is an exception to that. This is the only place I've seen where there is still um, worship of a Bataraka going on daily, in the sense of when we were there, we saw some RT being um, performed at what is, um, his padukas are behind. This is a miniature gadi, so representing his seat. And this is Vidyanandi. Um, this is the first half of the 16th century. Um, Vidyanandi Kshetra is the place in Surat. And apart from this daily RT, there is an, I haven't seen this myself, but there's an annual mela in which, which is supposed to be on the death day of the Bhattaraka. So this is like uh, four or five centuries after his death, this is still being celebrated. And in that sense, this is a unique case of what I think will probably be, have been happening at the Chhatris, at all of those Chhatris each day or each year. So um, quite extensive worship here of both his Padukas and an anthropomorphic image, but this is added later on. Uh, it draws a lot of people and indeed a booklet here found there let me show it to you now, maybe the full thing. It says here, Om Harim Surat Nagar Nivasi, Shri Vidyanandi, Bio, and then the thing goes, and this is what you found in all eightfold worship, Ashtadravya Puja, Digambara texts, whether it's a Jina or a Bataraka, Atra Avatara Vatara, so descend right here, Sam Voshak, Ahvanam, Ahvananam is just like the calling, so the Bataraka is being called to descend, Atra Tishta Tishta Tahata Stapanam, Atra Mama Bava Bava Vashat, so the Bhattaraka is being called and the object of worship is being uh, stapana, established. So the same thing as we found in the manuscripts, still being used actually at this annual fair in, in Surat also. Uh, and the, the, the parallel with the contemporary settings, these kinds of puja texts, here you have Vidya Sagar puja with the same structure here. And I found a lot of them and I, I got fascinated by them a bit. The, you find them in a lot of puja bats, some graha kind of texts, or in special brochures, commemoration volumes, etc. And they all, I mean, this is the start of it all, and then you get the eightfold worship of these, um, mostly deceased, sometimes also living monks. This is Vidya Sagar. Um, and this is um, 
Well, first of all, this is RT, so we had the Puja text. Um, the Gambra uh, lay people, at least the Bisa Pantis, they perform RT in the evening daily for the Jina image, and in a similar way they perform, they perform RT for a living ascetic also. So in the evening, uh, shortly before the ascetic would be taking rest, lay people were of the location where, the, where the, the Muni is residing for the day would gather and offer RT a lamp offering for this living ascetic, while he usually they're still reading their manuscripts a little bit undisturbed on, onwards. And later they sing these, uh, these very devotional songs. Um, and they're supposed to be songs, so let me do that and apologize for doing so after. So just a part of it, this goes, Jai Jai Guruvar Bhakata Pukare Arati Mangalagaya Karake Arati Badmanandi Ji Ki Mohati Mere Hat Jaya so the reason why I'm not afraid of singing is during my field work, I noticed that one's capacity of singing is not the most important criteria for doing so. <laughs> the thing, what the text says right here, the, the criterion that matters most is the amount of bhakti one, one gets to generate. Um, and so let's perform the arti. And what happens here is by performing the arti of uh, Padmanandiji, Acharya Padmanandiji, by performing the arti, mohati meri hattijaya, the darkness of ignorance is dispelled. So if you look at Jainism from a very um, doctrinal, say, karma siddhant kind of a perspective, this would be rather incredible, of course, but it's all, it's very, very devotional and it's very beautiful as far as I ask. And again, you have the trope of the, the team of the charanas, the feet of the living guru being uh, called upon here too. Uh, and, and this uh, is one of I think is one of the most beautiful lines of poetry I've read in the last few years. I don't read a lot of it, but still it's not dependent on its literary characteristics, but because of the whole setting of devotion in which I read it and sang it along with the people. And um, it has the, the charana team and it goes like, Guru are tere charanon ki muji dool ju mil jaye, charanon ki raj paakar takdeer badal jaye. Guru var tere charno ki mujh dool jo mil jaye charno ki raj paakar takdeer badal jaye so again the last piece and this is a very typical south asian thing of course the, the the guru's feet are an important thing and the dust of the guru's feet are still a blessing to have on your head and the last thing again which happens is by having this dust of the guru's feet on your head Takdir badal jaye, one's fate will change or one's karma will change in a way, you see. So these are very devotional texts and this is a general guru bhakti, but performed again for this living ascetic sitting there. And this here again says that what are the fruits to be reaped by the laity performing this? It says that milakar jogunagawi, we having come together and singing these artis and singing the glory of these ascetics, um, manusha janama safal, our human life will be successful or will be fulfilled, and heaven, good luck, and all of these good things will be met. So um, just by devotion, we actually get good karmic results. Uh, this is a very fascinating genre. I have a lot of them, and interestingly here also, they, they sing the glory of these ascetics. They present them as ideal ascetics in the sense of being um, self-restrained or this or that quality, very wise, very compassionate. And at the same time, they enter these kind of biographical data. So typical in both the artis and the pujas of these contemporary munis now, you would have the names of the mother and the father being mentioned. So very specific biographical data. The name of the, the Diksha Guru here. In this case, this is an arti of three acharyas of this one lineage at the same time. And for all three of them, their birth place, their native place is being given. So the nice thing about these hagiographical text is that they present the ascetic ideal and in a way they combine that to very particular details so they show what is the ascetic ideal and they connect it to what this particular so I mean uh, in a very crude way you could say that if you worship a jina image in the end it's just stone but when you have this living representative even though maybe he's not really ideal you have a, an image of an example of flesh and blood which is just much more inspiring in a way so that's what I read into it and that's why I think these bio specific biographic data are just as important as the idea of representing the ideal. We should go back to the Batarakas, and there's these uh, manuscripts, these Gitas, these songs. I found a few of them here in Nagar, but a uh, very important uh, author for the subject of uh, Batarakas, Kastur uh, Kasliwal, mentions many more, edited a few. So it seems to have been a very 
well-spread and often used genre. These are songs um, like here, Dharmakirti Gunagaya, so here comes the singing of the glory of the Bhattarakas. Uh, this Dharmakirti, this is a 16th century Bhattaraka, but the same Gutaka had also Bhattaraka Gitas of later Bhattaraka, so this is 17th century stuff at least. Mm, and what they serve for, the text themselves explain that these songs are supposed to be sung by beautiful women as a Mangalachara when the Bhattaraka came to town, so to welcome him in, in a way. What else? You get these percussive instruments being beaten, so it's a very festive atmosphere, and the whole song is really, it's devotional. Uh, I mean, this is typical devotional stuff. More mana adika anandu, so my mind is so happy just with the sight of this Bhattaraka. Uh, the, the, I mean, like um, other song compositions, non-Jain from this period, they give the, the, the raga in which the song is supposed to be sung, but they don't give much more musicological information. Um, but they're clearly meant to be sung, and they describe, again, they describe the Bhattarakas as ideal ascetics, and this is really the main point of the presentation, that they, and they would be going like, this is a, a Mahavrata Palai, so this Bhattaraka protects his Mahavratas, and there's so many examples, his five samitis, his three Gupti rules, and his 13 Vidi rules, these are all a typical monastic rules to be followed by an ideal monk, which would mean a Muni, not necessarily Bhattarak, but these texts actually read as descriptions of what a, a good Digambara monk should be like, and this is very strange when you first, like I have first read this secondary literature on the Bhattarakas, which says that they were basically lax and they were not so venerable. These Bhattarakas, whether they were or they were not, they surely are represented as ideal monks here. Um, a Bhuvna, a Bhuvna Kirti Geet here, uh, edited by Kasliwal, Last example, just Sudeki Darsanu Talahi Bhavaduka. So only from the, the mere sighting of this Bhattaraka, my existential suffering is being uh, erased. Um, so seven minutes? Seven minutes, thank you. That's perfect, thank you. Um, they're called Nirgrant and Mahamuni. They're, they're supposed to have the 28 Mula Gunas of a Digambara ascetic or the Dasalakshina Dharma, so it, it represents them with all the typical epithets, the typical descriptions of what a Muni is supposed to be like. And the last example, and I'll skip over this, I've written a bit more about this in the written version of this paper, Patawalis, I'm still looking into that. So these are lineage texts of the historical successions of Batarakas, but they trace them back to the Acharyas, which came before the Batarakas, and trace them back to Gotama, and in the end to, to Mahavirji, of course. Um, and these do the same things, they describe the qualities of the Bhattarakas and so on. Typically these texts, the older, say first millennium Acharyas, you just get a, a list of names, but then the later ones, so the Bhattarakas, you, you do get these longer descriptions with all their qualities being sung. And what I wrote in that paper was that it seems a bit like, some of it might be based on real historical memory of what these ascetics were and what their specific qualities were, but whereas in the Gitas, in the Pujas, you seem to have like all the necessity necessary qualities of a good ascetic being projected on this one person, whether he's ideal or not. What seems to happen here, in a way, maybe, is that all these necessary qualities are spread, like, distributed all over the lineage, like, one Bhattaraka is an expert in Agama, and another is a Syadvad expert, and another one is a Vanvasi, a Tapasvi, etc. So, the, the whole lineage, instead of just one ascetic, the whole lineage is represented as, as consisting entirely, I mean, together as a ideal monks. Um, well, I didn't talk yet about, there's, there's much less proof, but there's some Padukas or 11th century Acharyas, so which predates the Bhattaraka area being worshipped in exactly the same way. There is these kinds of eightfold texts which are still very commonly used and which also have this eightfold worship of monastic leaders. So I'm just drawing the parallels here with what came before the Bhattarakas in a way. And if you refer in a very general way to the Namukar mantra, which presents these five types of um, Paramishtins as venerable, the, the Jinas, the Siddhas, the Acharyas, the Upajayas, and all the monks. I mean, it of course has a hierarchy, starting from the Jinas to all the monks, but it does represent them, I think, all as like five, all five as equally worshipped, so in the end, worshipable, venerable, so in the end, it doesn't really matter if you're worshipping a Jina or this living Muni. You're, you're actually worshipping the living, I, the living or the deceased ideal monks, so or you're, you're worshipping the ascetic ideal. 
Uh, just some parallels, so with what came before, I already told you about these examples with what we see now, the pujas and the chhatris, which are really identical, you could say. And worship of living ascetics, actually this eightfold worship um, is also performed daily in the, the feeding ritual of Digambara Munis, but just before he gets his food, they do a very, seems almost formal kind of worship of the, of the Munis today. Um, so the conclusion, as I announced, would be that there really was a very, very strong devotion and worship of Batarakas as ideal ascetics. Again, if they were or they were not, they surely were being worshipped as representing this ascetic ideal. Um, I can conclude in three, four minutes. Will that be on time? Yeah. Two, three, yeah. I think you'll be okay. Yeah. Now, how to explain the fact that Batarakas being clothed, being sedentary, surely are not ideal Digambara monks, but they, uh, monks, but they were worshipped as being such. How to explain this? Well, some of them probably were far more ascetically inclined or active than we would uh, suggest. This Sakla Kirti Raz here describes this, um, this 15th century Bhattaraka as having been a naked monk for 18 years before he actually ascended the Bhattaraka Pad, etc. That's a very obvious reason. Then the Bhattarakas are worshipped as an ascetic ideal when no ideal ascetics are present. As I said, in this period there were very few Muni, so you could you could maybe think that the Bhattarakas, well, I don't don't use the word substitute, etc. But that would be an idea. Um, I think a superior explanation would be the next one that devotion of asceticism and devotion to the ascetic ideal are um, are a crucial element of, of of Jaina lay practice and Jaina monks practice as well and Guru Bhakti. Of course, just, and, I mean, this is really the, the main conclusion in a way for me that bhakti is just such a, a crucial element of, of, of Jaina practice, even if it's not an ideal ascetic, etc. Or, and I have some um, quotations here to explain what I meant here, they symbolize the ascetic ideal, again, characters here, even those munis of the most modest, they exemplify extraordinary asceticism and are accorded respect by the laity on those grounds alone, on what they exemplify, not necessarily on what they are individually, particularly. Similarly here by Silber, in the case of Buddhist monks, she makes the same point. Monks are not fully required to adhere to the highest values. It's enough if they symbolize them. What is crucial is their potency as symbols of renunciation. So you use this living ascetic as an ideal to worship whether he is or he is not. Now, very, very fastly, um, I've tried to show him that Bhattarakas were just as charismatic as monks are today. The other way around, you could also partly at least try to show the ways in Munis today carry the same kind of clerical administrative functions as the Bhattarakas are more readily identified with. Um, even though, like we heard this afternoon, the publication of scriptures by Sritambara monks is much more known today. Also, the Gambara ascetics carry great weight in that project. Um, Acharyas today also consecrate images, and they inspire building projects. Um, and the worldly involvement, which is supposed to be more typical for Batarakas, there is a few of these examples. Shanti Sagar Dakshin protested against the Mumbai state uh, temple entry bill or here Vidyanandi and Samantha Badra who fasted against in the Bahubali affair. So these are explicitly political stances they take really and leading the, the laity also. So even though they are supposed to be ideally not active in those fields, actually of course they are. And uh, the tantric practices with which Batarakas are more readily identified, um, some Munis today have publications of whole collections of mantras and, and uh, and yantras, etc. So, again, while doctrinally munis are not supposed to involve in tantra, they obviously do, at least some of them. So, you would get an a priori identification of the Bhattarakas with these practices and an a priori devaluation of these practices as being inappropriate for munis, whereas actually the, the distinction is not that clear. And this is the last point. Um, how to explain the fact that Batarakas were apparently very charismatic ideal monks, but in our 20th century descriptions disappeared as such and appeared as a kind of lax and ritualistic, um, not so ideal ascetic. Obviously the first reason is the, the revival of the Digambara Munilijas in the 20th century, so they have come to the spotlight and became the center of Lay's attention, this is no doubt the biggest reason, very the most obvious reason at least. 
why we do not consider Batarakas to have been charismatic now. There's the Terrapont opposition, of which we had this quotation, of course. Not just the Terrapont opposed the Batarakas, in a way, their opposition and their discourse of opposition has also, you could say, been internalized by the Bisapontis in the sense that today Bisapontis also, when they talk about Batarakas, they would stress this fact, the fact that they they protected the Gambra Jainism in this tough period. So they, the Bisapontis today also stress their clerical functions in a way. And this is an explanation, highly hypothetical, because it would take much more effort to explain it, but I'm taking a a parallel here with uh, something that has been spelled out much more clearly in the Western study of Hinduism, the way that uh, Westerners have perceived of Indian religious traditions in general. And it goes back to like a, a biblical roadmap of how to understand before scholars started working on their material or before the scholars even started, before the missionaries actually went to, to India or before the missionaries, before any travelers went to India, people in the West would already be knowing what they would be meeting in India, which would be uh, paganisms. But the idea, the, the idea would be that there was originally a Christian, a, a Christian revelation, and that this then declined into all kinds of heathenisms. And that interpretive framework, that template, then discusses this as a, a Protestant view, of course. Parallel to Catholicism, you would have corrupt and ritualistic priests who actually made this, this originally pure tradition, which in the case of Buddhism and Jainism was filtered from the scriptures, like saying, look, there was an original ascetic tradition, but what we see today when we go to India is, is quite different. And indeed, it would seem that the Bhattarakas just fitted this template as corrupt priests, like not just Buller, but all of the, the early uh, encounters or descriptions of Bhattarakas in the West I've seen, they describe them as priests or high priests, and they're very ignorant. And if I can conclude with a little joke here, Buller actually calls the Bataraka he met in Delhi. Oh, it's not a very big joke, but he, he calls them very ignorant. Apparently, he explains a few lines later on because they couldn't tell him much about the connection between the Bataraka lineages in the north and the south. And I think today we still don't know much more about it. So that leaves us in good company with, with, the, with this Bataraka here. So that was the third reason and the fourth one the Bhattaraka's involvement with, as Jains call it themselves, mantra, tantra, yantra, and the fact that in modern Jainism's discourse of Jainism as a scientific religion, as a very rational thing, there is no place whatsoever for mantra, this magical, ir irrational thing. So in those descriptions of Bhattaraka's of modern Jainism, you wouldn't want to be stressing those things which do not fit with the image of modern Jainism. So these are the four some of which may be hypothetical explanations of why, concluding why still whenever, as the Batarakas were very charismatic ideals, um, ascetics worshipped as ideal ascetics in their own period, why this understanding of them seems to have disappeared. Conclude? I hope I didn't do too bad with the time. You're okay, thank you so very much.